Zora Neale Hurston presaged the kind of anthropology that we're doing now, meaning that you learn something about a culture from what she's doing. These are true accounts of people's stories. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. With me today, three guests. David Berlinski is a philosopher, mathematician, and author, and is now the editor of Inference, the International Review of Science. David Galarenter is a professor of computer science at Yale and the author of a number of books. Stephen Meyer is a philosopher and author. He directs the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute, a think tank in Seattle. Here's what brings us together. David Galarenter published an essay titled, Giving Up Darwin. Quote, Stephen Meyer's thoughtful and meticulous book, Darwin's Doubt, convinced me that Darwin has failed. The Deniable Darwin and Other Essays, a book by David Berlinski, is also, quote, essential. The first question I want to ask you, and is, I know that, what is your general impression of Hurston's views on race? How would you characterize what she thinks about race? Yes, Mimi. The best way I can put it is that she doesn't think much about it at all. She knows others make these differentiations, but for her, she's just a person. Right, we're all bags filled with a random assortment of things. I love that ending. She is certainly aware of her blackness. She is also unlike both the black and white intellectuals of the time. Quickly, because I want to go into the arguments against, but does this, did you have the same response? Does Darwin strike you as beautiful? Never for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Problem one, the fossil record. Darwinian evolution, I'm quoting you, is gradual step by step. Yet in the Cambrian explosion of around a half a billion years ago, a striking variety of new organisms, including the first ever animals, pop up suddenly in the fossil record over a mere 70 million years, close quote. Now, 70 million years seems to be plenty of time for all kinds of surprising things to this layman. It was a problem that even Darwin was aware of, and he wrote about it in The Origin of Species. He said it was inexplicable on his view of, of life. He felt that the future fossil finds would fill in the, the missing ancestral forms that were evident. A huge number of what are called the animal body plans, uh, where a body plan is a unique configuration of body parts and tissues. So record. If, if this wall were the side of a canyon, halfway up we'd see... You've, you have a stripe of rock, and in that stripe you'd find a whole bunch of new forms of, of animal life. And that, under, in the layers underneath, there would be no intermediate, there'd be nothing, nothing leading with, to with that. any discernible connection. Right. right. And so the, the Cambrian explosion itself has been differently dated, but increasingly the, the, the date that David used of 70 million years is a very generous date. For the age range is actually narrowing as a result of additional findings. It's now about 10 million years is the increasingly accepted date. Major explosion in, in one Chinese scene, there's 13 to 16 different major groups of animals that have arisen in a five to six million year window. It's, it's incredibly abrupt geologically when you consider the age of the Earth in the four and a half billion years. It's also very abrupt biologically because there is a mathematical branch of Darwinian theory called population genetics that allows us to calculate how much change, evolutionary change, we ought to expect in a given amount of time if we know things like the mutation rate, the generation time, the right. population sizes. Five, 10, even 70 million years is a blink of an eye in terms of those, the calculations that can be made for what are called waiting times. And the expected waiting times for the amount of change that's evident in the Cambrian blow out the time scale, if you will. There are hundreds of millions or billions of years. So this is a really unexpected event, both biologically, mathematically, and geologically on a Darwinian view of things. New life, new form of life, means new protein, means new gene. I'll explain it in, in terms that would be familiar to David. If you want to give a computer a new function, write a new program for it to accomplish a new function, you've got to give it new code. And the big discovery of 20th century biology, following Watson and Crick in what's now called the molecular biological revolution, is the same thing is true in life. You want to invent a new form of life. And in this huge, unimaginably vast universe of possible combinations, the number of combinations that would produce a useful protein is what? Very Exceedingly rare. Explosion of biological information. And that fact gives us a way of grappling with this 
question that Darwin didn't have, because we know something about what it takes to generate information in our high-tech digital world of computing. Right. Right. And so if we think about the 1920s, and this is the time that, that we're in here, in this great chapter in the King book on Hurston's experiences, was one of the most virulently racist times in American history. The real kind of inflection point for the reconsolidation of white power in, in American institutions. And here, Zora Neale Hurston is essentially, you know, finishing her undergraduate studies and becoming a graduate student at that time in anthropology and then going into folklore, right? Many, many, many anthropologists in the 21st century, whatever our race, class, ethnicity, gender, um, orientation, all of those identity positions are writing in a similar, what we would call writerly way. It's normally what you get in a book about a, a book about anthropology, which we call an ethnography, right? A book length study of a given people. There was an extraordinary conference in the 1960s con convened by a number of MIT scientists, some of whom David knew very well, Murray Eden, Murray Eden Marcia, Marco Schussenberger, Mar and uh, they were the first to see the mathematical problem with Darwinism. They called it, the, their conference was called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. But at the, at the time they could compute the number of possible arrangements, but they didn't know at the time how many of the arrangements would result in functional proteins that would do a job in the cell. It's like, uh, unlikely that you can do a random search and find a, meaning, a meaningful string of characters in DNA that will produce a meaningful protein. Okay. But people didn't know in, in the 1960s. By the, by the early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental measures of the rarity of the functional genes and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio is one uh, protein that will fold into a, a functional structure for, uh, compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is one over 10 to the 77th power. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare it's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end, correct? That's the and theory. that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable, let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on, one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. That wonderful episode of The Simpsons, do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing in a million typewriters. <laughs> They're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, it was the best of times, it was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times, it was the blurst of times, you stupid monkey. <laughs> stupid monkey. <laughs> <laughs> or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film, where he's uh, uh, trying to get a date with a, a young lady he fancies, and she tells him to go away. He says, well, what are the, what are the odds a, a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? You know, not good. And he says, what do you mean, not good? Well, like one in a hundred? And she says, like one in a million. And then he says, well, but if there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! <laughs> Here's a precise way of uh, cashing out this probabilistic argument. Every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. Every time one of those uh, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you've got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, search one ten trillion trillionth one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? 
you're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. 